You know, it's of great interest to me that God, in his sovereign wisdom, had me choose these hymns months ago. Yet that first hymn spoke of how he calls us home to sit down at his banquet feast. How beautiful and appropriate, at least for me, this week. The one that we've just sung has my name in it and reminds me three times and summarizes it in the fourth verse that I must love Jesus more than anything else in this world including the greatest human love of my life my dear wife who is now with the Savior Christian follow me Christian love me more Christian love me more than these God shows those hymns for me today I had no idea what was coming and God chose last week's message in advance of the home going of my wife do you remember what the message was entitled last week death doors and direction dear friends there are no mistakes in the sovereign plan of God a message on death five days before Judy died there is a God in heaven and if through this message I begin to weep remember what the choir just sang about the tears of Jesus and his weeping he weeps for us because he loves us and he gives us joy in the spite of sorrow please excuse me for a moment <laughs> it's not only my eyes that weep the message today is entitled Israel God's firstborn son and we've read that passage just a few moments ago but I'm going to spend a little bit more time than usual in review this week because how God has burned some of these lessons into my life at the end of this past week with the death of my dear wife dear Judy the lessons that we all learned last week you recall included things such as sometimes God kills people or waits until they're dead to open doors for the next step in his plan sometimes God takes his own children home because of other reasons of blessing we looked briefly at a few of those we saw that Abel died in faith and Seth took his place we saw God killed the world in the flood of Noah and started over with Noah and his family we saw Terah moving his family from Ur of Chaldees to Haran on his way to Canaan but he stopped there and so he died before God called Abram to go the rest of the way to Canaan and receive God's blessing we saw that each of the patriarchs died before their descendants began to experience the covenant blessings we saw that God waited until Moses original enemies were dead before sending him back to Egypt and that's clearly stated in the text that we read this morning all those that sought thy life are dead we saw that the children of Israel who were aged 20 years old and older who rebelled against God ten times all had to die in the wilderness before their children were able to go in to inherit the promised land we saw that in churches that have sinned often there appears to be a period of time when all those who have violated God's commands also die before the next generation experiences the blessings of God 
There were several illustrations I did not have time to cover last week, but I'll give them to you today because they are apropos. One was clearly a man that was an obstacle that God had to move out of the way before his next stage of operation. That man was Herod the Great. It doesn't matter, and we need to realize this, how small or how larger than life you are, God can remove any obstacle in his way and in his time. The corollary to that is, at the same time, he can also erect a different obstacle to divert our path into the way that he wants to go. In scripture, this dual principle happened so that God could fulfill a specific prophecy concerning the Messiah, and we find that Herod the Great and one of his descendants were key in the fulfillment of that prophecy. I'm reading out of Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 19. You remember, Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus had gone to Egypt, and Herod was seeking his life. Verse 19, but when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. Precisely the same thing that God told to Moses about the Pharaoh and his cohorts who had been seeking Moses' life. Here we find it again in the context of Herod dying, and so there is movement in the plan of God. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But now we find that God is going to direct him to a specific part of the land of Israel. He's going to go someplace where he wasn't planning to go, but it'll still be in Israel, but not where he was planning to go in Israel. He arose, took the young child and his mother, came to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea, in the room of his father Herod, interesting, he had apparently planned to go to Judea. He heard that Herod was dead. But God put somebody in Judea. It says he was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding, and God works even with our fears, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. God said, you're not going to the south, you're going to go to the north. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. God removed one obstacle that would have covered the land. God told him, go back to the land of Israel. He goes back, and God puts a different obstacle in the way to divert him to a location prophesied in the Old Testament. Is our God in control? Is our God sovereign over history? Is our God sovereign in the life of individuals who are his people? And the answer is a resounding yes. We have a God who is in control and we can trust him regardless of the circumstances of life. Another very clear illustration of God removing an obstacle to his plan and for the spread of the gospel is Herod Agrippa I, another one of that Herodian family which was so evil and wicked and we've talked about all those members of that family in great detail in the past and what parts of Israel they covered and all the horrible things that they did and all their horrendous incest and intermarriage and multiple wives and horrible things. Well, there's one standing in the way here in Acts chapter 12. Starting in verse 20. Herod, and this is Herod Agrippa I, Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon, but they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus the king's chamberlain their friend, desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel and sat upon his throne, made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a god and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. And you know we described that in detail and talked about the worm in scripture and how in hell their worm dieth not, the flame is not quenched. 
and how the worm feeds sweetly on them. God gave a very graphic illustration here in Acts chapter 12. But now I want you to notice verse 24. But the word of God grew and multiplied. God moved an obstacle so that the spread of the gospel might go forth with power. But, Herod was eaten with worms, but the word of God grew and was multiplied. Those are great encouragements to know that we have a sovereign God. A God who, when there's an obstacle that's standing in the way, may suffer that obstacle for a period of time, but his plan will go forward and his will shall be accomplished. Basically, God removes people who are in the way to make room for the next generation that will obey and serve him instead of their own petty, carnal desires. And as with Herod Archelaus, God also places other people in the way to divert the path of his chosen people. God uses death to open doors for others when a man stands in the way of the plan of God. God uses death and the vacuum caused by death to give direction to those who are still alive. Death changes the players on the playing field. Death changes the values in the equation. Death makes certain personal goal accomplishments impossible and sets new goals to accomplish. Death ends carnal pursuits. Death finalizes our opportunities for earning heavenly rewards. Death puts the final period on the test paper that will be judged by the Lord of all flesh. And this is a quotation, a statement that I made last week, this next. And oh, how God has burned it into my heart this week. I said last Sunday, death comes when we are least expecting it in most cases. Death comes when we are least expecting it in most cases. Dear people, take that to heart. God has burned that into my heart this week. That's what happened to me and Judy. But death is not always, as we said before, a judgment to the one dying. Oh, we emphasize that because sinners need to hear it and they need to repent. But death is not always a judgment to the one dying. Death sometimes comes as a reward to the faithful who have finished their course and who have kept the faith. Death sometimes comes as a wake-up call to those who have been left behind. That's us that they will rouse their zeal for Christ, that they will maximize their life with a focus on eternal things instead of the stupidity of the foolish temporal things and how much pleasure we want here. Death sometimes comes as a challenge to the next generation of warriors to step into the gap, into the shoes of the fallen hero of faith, to pick up the weapons, to march forward in the battle for truth. Last Sunday, when I preached the message that I've just summarized for you, neither Judy nor I had the slightest hint that death was coming for Judy on Friday night, less than two days ago. But I remember coming home after closing up the church after the morning service. And Judy was beaming as I walked through the kitchen door. This is what she said about that message on death. This is what she said. That was a wonderful message, she said. And then she added an encouragement, something like, I think you're the best preacher in the world. She often said things like that. It's not true, but, and I told her so every time she said it. But 
that's what she said. She often said that. She was my number one encourager, my number one cheerleader. And how I loved her. And how I was thankful for her. But the Lord Jesus, even in those conversations, would always receive the glory. She always gave the glory to God for letting us be married and be co-laborers in the ministry. At trustee meeting on Monday night, I had no clue that death was coming for Judy in four days. On Tuesday at Women's Missionary Society, she was there with her mom and I was there. We had no clue that death was coming for Judy in just three days. At prayer meeting and session meeting on Wednesday night, I had no clue that death was coming for Judy in just two days. On Thursday night, and oh, I thank God for the grace of giving me this. On Thursday night, almost as if on the spur of the moment, I took Judy out to eat at a very fancy restaurant, something we never do. We almost always go to Burger King or something like that. But on Thursday night, I took her out, totally breaking the pattern to a very, very fancy, expensive restaurant. We had a, an incredibly wonderful time together. As we smiled and talked and shared with one another, I had no clue that in 24 hours, Judy would be in the loving arms of the Savior. Friday night came, and Judy was across the finish line. She was home in heaven. People, when things like this happen, I hope you think about it. I hope you ponder it. If you believe in a sovereign God, I hope you say, Lord, I thank you. I don't understand it. It hurts. What are you trying to teach me? I did. I pondered about it. I've thought about it long and hard for the last two days. And a question came to my mind. Would I have done anything different if I had known that this was the last week of Judy's life on earth. Would I have ignored the petty little things that I was doing on those days so that I might intensely spend a few more precious hours with the beautiful woman whom I loved more than my own life, whom I loved more than anything else on earth? Dear friends, that is how all of us should examine every day as God gives it to us. Death is coming. How are you spending your few precious moments on earth as time drifts by and as you float toward eternity? What are you doing with the ones you love and the service that you render together for the Lord Jesus Christ? That message is burned into my heart. It has seared there an indelible impression. Perhaps Someday soon, death is coming for me too. 
It definitely will come. I just don't know when. You know something? I look forward to it with the greatest interest and expectancy. I don't fear it. I don't yearn for it. But I look forward to it with eagerness and expectancy and with great interest. Well, what happened this last week has re again brought me into focus. By the grace of God, right now I am focused on the race that God has given to me with all my strength. I also want to win the prize. Even as Judy has already burst through the finish line with all of her heart. That's what happens sometimes in a race. Your heart bursts. That's what happened to her. And she was enthusiastic about her race. Even moments before she died, she was speaking with enthusiasm to the doctor. She's crossed the finish line to the applause of the crowds of spectators in heaven. She has won her race. She has won her race. She's received the victor's crown from the hands of the great judge, the laurel wreath, the crown of glory that fadeth not away. Dear friends, there is also a crown reserved for you in heaven if you finish your race with excellence. Death will definitely come for you. But remember our contrasts as to how it comes. Will it come in judgment? Or will it come as a reward for finishing your race with excellence, not mediocrity. God does not bless mediocrity. God blesses excellence. Everything you do should be with excellence. Do all for the glory of God. Whatsoever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all for the glory of God. And whatsoever you do, not just what you think, not what your theology is in the box. What are you doing with it for the glory of God? Sitting on the bench, eating popcorn. Dear friends, you will give an account. You are in a race, whether you like it or not. You will cross the finish line. The question is how? I've been in hundreds of races in my life. And at the last moment, where you're exerting every fiber in your body with all of its strength, and you thrust your chest forward and your arms back, and you bend into the wire to hit that tape before somebody next to you hits it. I've been there. I know what Paul's talking about. I now understand the illustration. And you're in a spiritual race on your way to heaven. Are you running your race with excellence? Everything you do to the glory of God. Not because of the lusts of the flesh, not because of covetousness, not because of laziness and sloth and all the other things, the sins which doth, as Paul says in Hebrews, such those sins which so easily beset us. Let us run the race with patience, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and to sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. How are you running your race? That got burned into my heart this week. Am I giving it my all? I relied on her. You know I did. I relied on her and her filling some gaps for me. Perhaps I didn't run as hard as I could have because I put burden on her. And God said, Christian, it's time for you to start running your race the way you're supposed to start running your race. Christian, love me more than these. And God planned that song months ago. 
and he burned it into my heart on Friday night. Do you love him more than these? You know, Judy had a shorter race to run than I have. But each one of us has been given a specific race to run. It might be a sprint, short distance, middle distance, long distance. There are different kinds of runners. The coach doesn't put his sprinters into the two-mile. He doesn't put his two-milers into the 100-yard dash. But each race is important for the team to win. I don't know if you're a sprinter. I don't know if you are short distance, middle distance, long distance, marathon. But you know what God has given you to do now. What kind of a race are you running? Are you running it with excellence to the glory of God and not to fulfill your own desires? I suspect that dear Judy, who is in heaven now, is looking down and perhaps even listening to this sermon. She loved to listen to my sermons. I can't understand that. Nobody else does. <laughs> but she loved to listen to my sermons. And we would interact about them afterwards. She'd tell me where I was wrong. <laughs> she could read Hebrew and Greek. And uh, I always appreciated that. You know, that keeps a preacher honest. <laughs> How I loved her, people. How I loved her. God made her precisely for me. What a woman. I suspect that maybe she's listening to the sermon. But I suspect that, more importantly, she desires that I would heed the words of the Apostle Paul to young Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul writes, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Here is the charge he gives to this young preacher boy. Preach the word. That's the motto of Dallas Seminary. Kruxon ton logon. Preach the word. And I know that's what Judy would have me do. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine. People hate doctrine today. They hate reproving. They hate rebuking. They want the soft jelly message. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They figure out what kind of desires they have in their heart, and then they look around for somebody who agrees with them and who will sort of give them some kind of a placebo to make them feel good about what they know they're doing is wrong. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Run your race with excellence, he's saying. Because as in a relay race, where four runners hand the baton to the next man, Paul's handing it to Timothy. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. Will you be able to say that when you stand before Jesus? Oh, I pray God I will be able to say that. I know there have been times when I have been lazy in ministry. I know there have been times when I have not been diligent in ministry. But by the grace of God, I want to run hard to catch up where I should be. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Three things, people. 
Are you fighting a good fight? Are you running your course with excellence? Are you keeping the faith? And you know what the result of that is? Verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, there is a judge. Did you know that? You will stand before him. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. He doesn't give it to people who've cheated in the race, who've tripped other runners, who've taken steroid drugs. He gives, he's a righteous judge, he gives it to those who have kept the faith, fought the good fight, finished their course. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And how I praise God for the last half of this verse. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. All those also who love his appearing. If you love his appearing, do you know how it will change your life? Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself. And he's talking about the blessed hope, the imminent return of Christ. It changes your life, people. It's not merely head theology. So just remember, for whatever reason, good or bad, death is coming for you. Don't put yourself in the place of one who must be removed like Pharaoh and Herod before the blessing of God can come on others. Remember what we just said, God not only provides death as a finish line for victors, God also removes people who are in the way to make room for the next generation that will obey and serve him instead of their own petty, carnal desires. And you know, as we're going to see in just a few verses from our text today, sometimes that just, all it has to be is a threat of death that God uses to give directions. That's what God does in the next couple of verses. He threatens to kill Moses for not circumcising his sons. The second lesson we learn that God sometimes uses death to remove excuses that we have for not obeying the will of God. And, um, you know, it's amazing how many excuses we have. We know what God wants, but we've got an excuse for why we don't quite have to do it the way God said. God said to Moses, I'm going to give you a fresh start. You're no longer on the most wanted list. In fact, nobody even remembers who you are except your family. And, of course, there were still family members who were alive, and we talked about that. We saw death is about perspective and new beginnings. That's even true when we look at the death and resurrection of Christ. When we look at our own spiritual death and new birth in Christ, just like Moses was given a fresh start by God, so even so the believer is given a fresh start in Christ. The th third lesson that we learned was God gives direction, and when he does, he includes our families. Fourth lesson we learned was do exactly what God tells you to do. Don't try to change the command, and something that is more pleasant to you, find something else. The last lesson we learned was don't try to accomplish anything in the will of God in the power of the flesh. It says Moses took the rod of God in his hand. If you do anything apart from the power of God, you will fail. And that's why Jesus said, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. Israel, God's firstborn son, I told you that I was going to spend a little more time on review because of what God burned into my heart. Painful searing of God's branding iron. But I hope we will not forget the lessons he taught. Brings us to our text today. Let me read those key verses again short. The Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand. But I will harden his heart that he shall not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. 
the first thing we notice in this text is that God said unto Moses, when thou goest to return to Egypt. He did not say, if thou goest to return into Egypt. At this point, going, we would think, would be assumed because God has taken all the wind out of Moses' sails as he tried to sail in the wrong direction. But you know, there's not going to be any wind, no power, until Moses turns his rudder and sails in the direction that God requires. Likewise, for us, there is no supernatural power, the power of the Holy Spirit, in our sails when we try to sail in a direction that is contrary to the will of God. God did not leave the choice up to Moses. He said, when, not if. Moses will go because God is in control and has sovereignly willed it that Moses should go. The second thing that we notice in our text today is that God once again commands Moses to do the miracles that God had already entrusted to Moses. Now, I think most of us would think that's a no-brainer. Of course, Moses would want to do those miracles, you would say. Of course, that gives him the opportunity to prove that he's God's chosen vessel. That gives him something for protection, like he could say, okay, you bad soldiers, don't think you can arrest me, I'll sick my snake on you and whop you with leprosy. So, why would God have to command Moses again to perform the miracles? I think there are many lessons in this, number one. You see, God is about to hit Egypt with ten plagues. But God isn't going to do it until Moses uses what Moses already has as a warning to Pharaoh. That's true for us, too. God will not give you more power, more resources, more money, more opportunities, more influence, or more of anything until you do what he has told you to do with what he has already given to you. Number two, God is not negligent in reminding us clearly of what our responsibilities are. That's why we have a Bible. You know, he reminds you every day if you read it of what you're supposed to do. He told Moses four or five times, he kept commanding him, go to Egypt and do these two miracles. He tells us thousands of times every day of our lives, if we read his word, exactly what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do. Number three, the fact that we have to be reminded so often, just like Moses, I think is an illustration of just how slothful and how disobedient we really are, although we don't like to admit it. Even after having been faced down by God, just like Moses was. The fourth reason shows us what was really in Moses' heart. God kept telling him, go down, take care of that uh, snake situation in Egypt. Go down and show them what leprosy is really like, because I've got some other things they need to learn, but you've got to show them that first. You see, Moses had grown up in the courts of Pharaoh for 40 years. Moses had seen the court magicians, people under the control and power of Satan. They could do impressive stuff. Moses knew that they had some supernatural contacts and some supernatural powers. Maybe Moses felt that he wasn't quite ready and up to their proficiency to go nose to nose and nose and toe to toe with those magicians in spiritual combat. God told him to go. The third thing is what I like to call the lesson of remembrance. The real source of any spiritual power that we may have is God and not us. We tend to forget in the moment of the euphoria of accomplishment the lesson of remembrance. What does the text say? See that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh which I have put in thine hand. God uses Moses of the human agency, but the power comes from God. It does not come from Moses, though he is the agent which I have put in thine hand. Anytime you see the supernatural agency at work, do not try to claim credit for yourself as the human agent. God is the one who provided the power, even if he used you as a tool with which he did the work. The fourth lesson is the lesson of divine ordination. 
divine ordination. Often we think that the spiritual gifts, talents, abilities, resources, contacts, influence and opportunities that God has given to us will have certain results when we faithfully use those same gifts and talents and abilities and resources and contacts and influence and opportunities if we use them faithfully in the way God called us to use them. I mean, that's our mindset, isn't it? Well, Lord, you gave me these gifts. I'm using them correctly. I'm using them in the power of your Holy Spirit. I'm being obedient to you. But then we take one further step and we say, and so I expect certain results. Because after all, look what I'm doing. I'm doing it the way you said I'm supposed to do it. And so I expect certain results from it. When we do that, we put God into a tiny little box of our own expectations. But God is not limited to the wet little paper bag to which we have tried to isolate him. Sometimes he requires us to faithfully use those same gifts and talents and abilities and resources and contacts and influence and opportunities, listen carefully, to produce the exact opposite results that we were expecting. And that's what happened in the case of Pharaoh. Did you catch that? God says, I want you to do those things. That supernatural power, it's my power. You're going to go down there. You're going to carry my message. You're going to do my works. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Exact opposite results that Moses might have expected. Go in the power of the Spirit of God and then we expect magnificent, from the human perspective anyway, results. Our job is not to determine results. Our job is to obey what God has told us to do. But I will harden his heart that he shall not let the people go. God has given to every one of us in this room one or more spiritual gifts to edify, that is to build up, the body of Christ, the church. And God does expect you to use your gifts in the power of the spirit and not in the power of the flesh. But God is not obligated to use your gifts in the way that you perhaps anticipate. For example, and I'll pull it back to myself rather than pointing at your gift. How many evangelists and pastor teachers, some of them quite gifted, have had a great vision of seeing multitudes of lost people get saved? Sinners coming to repentance, lives radically transformed to follow Christ, the church growing and moving forward against the gates of hell, bursting through the enemy lines with the enemy in terrified retreat. Every young preacher coming out of seminary is looking forward to that. And yet most men with the gifts of evangelist and pastor teacher faithfully labor away day after day in tiny churches in obscure locations with seemingly little results. Occasionally one or two come to Christ. Occasionally the hardened sinners in the church who are holding back the blessing of the Holy Spirit on that church, a few of those hardened sinners actually come to repentance. Occasionally one young person's life is radically transformed to follow Christ. A handful of church begins to grow and move forward against the gate of hell. Perhaps on rare occasion, we hear of a group of warriors bursting through the enemy lines on some obscure mission field and the enemy fleeing from them in terrified retreat. Did God fail? Or was it our expert expectations that were wrong? You see, God is not obligated to live up to our preconceived ideas. He tells us to faithfully use what you've been given. Leave the results to him. He uses the gifts that he's given to accomplish his purposes, even if we don't know what they are. The lesson of divine ordination is shrouded in the eternal mysteries and purposes of God, which all ultimately reflect his greatest glory. God is not always obligated to do what we are expecting him to do. 
God is not obligated to do what we were expecting him to do. I had to face that lesson in a blinding flash this past Friday as Judy passed into glory and as I stood at her bedside praying earnestly for her healing, holding her hand and watching her slip into eternity. God is not obligated to live up to our preconceived ideas. He is not obligated to do what we are expecting him to do. When I took her to the hospital, I was expecting that the doctors would discover what was wrong and solve the problem. She's a godly woman. By the grace of God, I'm trying to be a godly man. My expectation was that she and I would be married for many years to come. But at some point we could retire and enjoy one another because all these years life has been filled with the busyness of the children and the church and her mom and all the things that kept us in the position of ships passing in the night. And the one great thing that I looked forward to every day was rising with her early in the morning when everybody else is sound asleep and we couldn't be interrupted. 4.30 in the morning, we would pray, to pray together with her for an hour and a half to two hours every morning, all the way from the time that we were engaged and all the way through our married life, to pray with her, to feel the bond and the unity of Christ between us as we approach the throne of grace hand in hand. Dear people, that is what I will miss the most about my dear wife. She was a prayer warrior for you, for her children, for me, for the missionaries, some you have never heard of, but that we have known for more than 40 years of marriage and prayed for every morning. There is a hole torn in the garment and my heart is bleeding through it because she was a woman of God. Oh, men, I hope you have a woman of God. Women, I hope that you are a woman of God. I'm sorry. Learn the lesson of divine ordination and order your life accordingly. The fifth lesson for today is God always gives us a specific message to proclaim. Our job is to proclaim his message, not our own. We are not to add to it or subtract from it. The message is not our ideas. The message is his commands. Verse 22, And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. The message God has given to us is parallel to that. Thus saith the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ is God's only begotten son. Our message is who God's only begotten Son is and what God's only begotten Son has done. Who Jesus is and what he did. That's the heart of the gospel distilled for us in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. It tells us who Jesus is and what he did. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, the good news which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, and which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, here's the gospel, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is the good news. It's not how you feel about it. It's not what you've done, not whether you've walked down the aisle or not. It's what Jesus has finished. The issue for you is how will you receive the gospel? 
How will you respond to what Jesus has already finished and what he has already done? Here in our text, Israel is called as a nation the firstborn son, God's firstborn son. God calls Israel that himself. Do you understand that? In ancient Semitic cultures, the firstborn always had a double inheritance. The firstborn was always the one most loved. The firstborn would always get the blessing of God and the father's blessing, even if the firstborn was the son of a disfavored wife rather than the son of a favored wife. The law specifically prohibited the father from putting the son of the favored wife ahead of the son of a disfavored wife if the son of the disfavored wife was the firstborn. The firstborn became always the patriarch of the clan when the father passed away. The firstborn had the most authority. The firstborn had the most blessing. The firstborn had the most honor and prestige. The father would always defend the firstborn with the greatest valiance. The firstborn was the one who passed on the name and the seed of the father. And so this statement of warning, you tell Pharaoh, Israel is my son, my firstborn, that statement is a warning shot across the bow of Pharaoh. You see, he lived in an ancient Semitic culture. He would have understood the significance of Israel as the firstborn of Jehovah when Moses threw down the gauntlet. And so by refusing to let Israel go, Pharaoh was setting himself up for war against God. He had God's firstborn son tied up in captivity and behind him, and he was standing between God and God's firstborn son and sneering at God. Little did Pharaoh know how ferociously God would protect and defend his firstborn son, the nation of Israel. In the same manner, little does the world realize what God will do to those who sneer and reject at his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God said, You've got my son, you don't let him go. You think you can beat up on him and kill him? I'm going to kill your son. I'm going to kill your firstborn, and that's what happened at the end of the ten plagues. I will kill your firstborn son. God is going to fulfill his promise to Israel as the firstborn when we reach the millennium, the double portion blessing. Israel will be the nation in ascendancy over all the Gentile nations, according to the prophets. Isaiah says much about that. Israel will be the greatest of all the nations on earth. All the nations will flow. Isaiah tells us that they will flow to Jerusalem to worship. Israel will be the head and not the tail, to use an expression from the writings of Moses. I'll share with you one more personal thought. How Judy and I loved to talk about God's promises to Israel, you know we met in Israel, on Mount Zion, in Jerusalem, in the city of the great king, because we both loved Israel. And how Israel has begun to blossom like a rose, we would talk about that often. Blossom like a rose, according to Isaiah the prophet. Love for Israel was one of the many things that bound us so closely, so tightly together in our marriage. The final lesson, I'll make it quick. I know our time's up. Sixth lesson is, what a man sows, that will he also reap. The issue is God's firstborn son. The firstborn son was in danger. The life and freedom of the firstborn son was on the line. The two sides drew up their lines of battle, and without realizing it, Pharaoh was putting on his own firstborn son on the line. I say unto thee, let my son go, that he may serve me, and if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Verse 23. In a nutshell, that's the law of harvest. It's a law that is consistent throughout Scripture. What you sow, you reap. Galatians 6, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And then the encouragement. The encouragement to keep on sowing and to sow the right thing. Verse 9. 
And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Sowing in the spirit instead of sowing in the flesh. You will reap corruption if you sow in the flesh. It's a guarantee. But sometimes sowing in the spirit, it seems so long until the harvest finally gets there. And he explains it in verse 10, as we have therefore opportunity, and God will bring you opportunity if you ask him for it. Let us do a good unto all men, especially, Malista, by that, by that I mean to say, that's a, a, defini a defining word, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. That is, what are you doing in relation to a blessing for other brothers and sisters in Christ? And so, what a man sows, he will reap. Pharaoh learned that the hard way. The question is, have you set yourself up in challenge to God's only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ? Or have you trusted Him alone and submitted yourself to Him as your Lord and Savior? Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word and for its power, for its strength, for its comfort, for the challenge that it gives to us and the enablement by your Spirit to walk by faith, to believe it, to trust it, to not doubt it, to not argue with you, but to step forward looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Father, this is your word. There is no power in this preacher except the Holy Spirit. Speak through him. The power is in your word. It is your Son, Jesus Christ, who should be glorified. It is your word which should be held up for all to see. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For there is coming a time. Perhaps it's upon us already. In many circles it is already. They'll reject the sound doctrine. They'll look for somebody to scratch their ears to make them feel good. Father, let us not be that kind of a people. Take your word and sear it into our hearts and let us trust you in faith even in times of distress because you are God. You are God and God alone. Choose you this day whom you will serve, not merely think about, not merely have a canned theology about. Whom will you serve? Run your race with excellence. Oh, Father, let us do it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And again, the hymn which God had chosen before all of these.